A thermonuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon that uses the energy from a primary nuclear fission reaction to compress and ignite a secondary nuclear fusion reaction. The result is greatly increased explosive power when compared to single-stage fission weapons. It is colloquially referred to as a hydrogen bomb or H-bomb because it employs fusion of isotopes of hydrogen. The fission stage in such weapons is required to cause the fusion that occurs in thermonuclear weapons. The first full-scale thermonuclear test was done by the United States in 1952. The concept has since been employed by most of the world's nuclear powers in the design of their weapons. The modern design of all thermonuclear weapons in the United States is known as the Teller-Ulim configuration for its two chief contributors, Edward Teller and Stanislaw Ulim, who developed it in 1951 for the United States, with certain concepts developed with the contribution of John von Neumann, the first ready-to-use thermonuclear bomb, RD-6S, was tested on August 12, 1953, in the Soviet Union. Similar devices were developed by the United Kingdom, China, and France, as thermonuclear weapons represent the most efficient design for weapon energy yield in weapons with yields above 50 kilotons. Virtually all the nuclear weapons deployed by the five nuclear weapon states under the NPT today are thermonuclear weapons using the Teller-Ulam design. The essential features of the mature thermonuclear weapon design, which officially remained secret for nearly three decades, are separation of stages into a triggering primary explosive and a much more powerful secondary explosive. Compression of the secondary by X-rays coming from nuclear fission in the primary, a process called the radiation implosion of the secondary. Heating of the secondary, after cold compression, by a second fission explosion inside the secondary. The radiation implosion mechanism is a heat engine that exploits the temperature difference between the secondary stages hot, surrounding radiation channel and its relatively cool interior. This temperature difference is briefly maintained by a massive heat barrier called the pusher, which also serves as an implosion tamper, increasing and prolonging the compression of the secondary. If made of uranium, as is almost always the case, it can capture neutrons produced by the fusion reaction and undergo fission itself, increasing the overall explosive yield. In many Teller-Ulim weapons, fission of the pusher dominates the explosion and produces radioactive fission product fallout. Public knowledge concerning nuclear weapon design Detailed knowledge of fission and fusion weapons is classified to some degree in virtually every industrialized nation. In the United States, such knowledge can by default be classified as restricted data, even if it is created by persons who are not government employees or associated with weapons programs, in a legal doctrine known as born secret. Born secret is rarely invoked for cases of private speculation. The official policy of the United States Department of Energy has been to not acknowledge the leaking of design information, as such acknowledgement would potentially validate the information as accurate. In a small number of prior cases, the U.S. government has attempted to censor weapons information in the public press, with limited success. According to the New York Times, physicist Kenneth Ford defied government orders to remove classified information from his new book, Building the H-Bomb, A Personal History. Ford claims he only used pre-existing information and even submitted a manuscript to the government who wanted to remove entire sections of the book, for concern that foreign nations could use the information. Though large quantities of egg data have been officially released, and larger quantities of egg data have been unofficially leaked by former bomb designers, most public descriptions of nuclear weapon design details rely to some degree on speculation, reverse engineering from known information, or comparison with similar fields of physics. Such processes have resulted in a body of unclassified knowledge about nuclear bombs which is generally consistent with official unclassified information releases. 
related physics, and is thought to be internally consistent, though there are some points of interpretation which are still considered open. The state of public knowledge about the Teleulim design has been mostly shaped from a few specific incidents outlined in a section below. Basic Principle The basic principle of the Teleulim configuration is the idea that different parts of a thermonuclear weapon can be chained together in stages with the detonation of each stage providing the energy to ignite the next stage. At a bare minimum, this implies a primary section which consists of an implosion-type fission bomb, and a secondary section which consists of fusion fuel. The energy released by the primary compresses the secondary through a process called radiation implosion, at which point it is heated and undergoes nuclear fusion. Because of the stage design, it is thought that a tertiary section, again a fusion fuel, could be added as well. Based on the same principle as the secondary, the AN-602 Tsar bomber is thought to have been a three-stage device. Surrounding the other components is a whole round or radiation case, a container, which traps the first stage or primary's energy inside temporarily. The outside of this radiation case, which is also normally the outside casing of the bomb, is the only direct visual evidence publicly available of any thermonuclear bomb components configuration. Numerous photographs of various thermonuclear bomb exteriors have been declassified. The primary is thought to be a standard implosion method fission bomb, though likely with a core boosted by small amounts of fusion fuel for extra efficiency. The fusion fuel releases excess neutrons when heated and compressed, inducing additional fission. Generally, a research program with the capacity to create a thermonuclear bomb has already mastered the ability to engineer boosted fission. When fired, the plutonium-239 imp or uranium-235 core would be compressed to a smaller sphere by special layers of conventional high explosives arranged around it in an explosive lens pattern, initiating the nuclear chain reaction that powers the conventional atomic bomb. The secondary is usually shown as a column of fusion fuel and other components wrapped in many layers. Around the column is first a pusher tamper, a heavy layer of uranium-238 or lead which serves to help compress the fusion fuel. Inside this is the fusion fuel itself, usually a form of lithium deuteride, which is used because it is easier to weaponize than liquefied tritium, deuterium gas success of the lithium deuteride-based Castle Bravo experiment. This dry fuel, when bombarded by neutrons, produces tritium, a heavy isotope of hydrogen which can undergo nuclear fusion, along with the deuterium present in the mixture. Inside the layer of fuel is the spark plug, a hollow column of fissile material which, when compressed, can itself undergo nuclear fission. The tertiary, if one is present, would be set below the secondary and probably be made up of the same materials. Separating the secondary from the primary is the interstage. The fissioning primary produces four types of energy. 1. Expanding hot gases from high explosive charges which implode the primary. 2. Superheated plasma that was originally the bomb's fissile material, and its tamper. 3. The electromagnetic radiation. And 4. The neutrons from the primary's nuclear detonation. The interstage is responsible for accurately modulating the transfer of energy from the primary to the secondary. It must direct the hot gases, plasma, electromagnetic radiation and neutrons toward the right place at the right time. Less than optimal interstage designs have resulted in the secondary failing to work entirely on multiple shots, known as a fissile fizzle. The Kuhn shot of Operation Castle is a good example. A small floor allowed a neutron flux from the primary to prematurely begin heating the secondary weakening the compression enough to prevent any fusion. There is very little detailed information in the open literature about the mechanism of the interstage. One of the best sources is a simplified diagram of a British thermonuclear weapon similar to the American W-80 warhead. It was released by Greenpeace in a report titled Dual-Use Nuclear Technology. 
The major components and their arrangement are in the diagram, though details are almost absent. What scattered details it does include, likely have intentional emissions and or inaccuracies. They are labeled and cap a neutron focus lens and reflect a wrap. The former channels neutrons to the U-235 PU-239 spark plug while the latter refers to an X-ray reflector, typically a cylinder made out of an X-ray opaque material such as uranium with the primary and secondary at either end. It does not reflect like a mirror, instead, it gets heated to a high temperature by the X-ray flux from the primary. Then it emits more evenly spread X-rays which travel to the secondary, causing what is known as radiation implosion. In IV Mike, gold was used as a coating over the uranium to enhance the black body effect. Next comes the reflector neutron gun carriage. The reflector seals the gap between the neutron focus lens and the outer casing near the primary. It separates the primary from the secondary and performs the same function as the previous reflector. There are about six neutron guns each poking through the outer edge of the reflector with one end in each section, all are clamped to the carriage, and arranged more or less evenly around the casing's circumference. The neutron guns are tilted so the neutron emitting end of each gun end is pointed towards the central axis of the bomb. Neutrons from each neutron gun pass through and are focused by the neutron focus lens towards the center of primary in order to boost the initial fissioning of the plutonium. A polystyrene polarizer plasma source is also shown. The first U.S government document to mention the interstage was only recently released to the public promoting the 2004 initiation of the Reliable Replacement Warhead program. A graphic includes blobs describing the potential advantage of RRRW on a part-by-part -part level, with the interstage blob saying a new design would replace toxic, brittle material and expensive, special material, which require unique facilities. The toxic, brittle material is widely assumed to be beryllium, which fits that description and would also moderate the neutron flux from the primary. Some material to absorb and re-radiate the X-rays in a particular manner may also be used. The special material is thought to be a substance called FOGBANK, an unclassified code name, though it is often referred to as the fog bank, as if it were a sub-assembly instead of a material. Its composition is classified, though aerogel has been suggested as a possibility. Manufacture stopped for many years, however, the life extension program required it to start up again, White 12 currently being the sole producer. The manufacturing process used acetonitrile as a solvent, which led to at least three evacuations in 2006. Acetonitrile is widely used in the petroleum and pharmaceutical industries. Like most solvents, it is flammable and can be toxic. Summary A simplified summary of the above explanation is, an implosion assembly type of fission bomb is exploded. This is the primary stage. If a small amount of deuterium, tritium gas is placed inside the primary's core, it will be compressed during the explosion and a nuclear fusion reaction will occur. The released neutrons from this fusion reaction will induce Further fission in the plutonium-239 or uranium-235 used in the primary stage. The use of fusion fuel to enhance the efficiency of a fission reaction is called boosting. Without boosting, a large portion of the fissile material will remain unreacted. The little boy and fat man bombs had an efficiency of only 1.4% and 17%, respectively. Because they were unboosted, energy released in the primary stage is transferred to the secondary stage. The exact mechanism whereby this happens is secret. This energy compresses the fusion fuel and spark plug. The compressed spark plug becomes critical and undergoes a fission chain reaction, further heating the compressed fusion fuel to a high enough temperature to induce fusion, and also supplying neutrons that react with lithium to create tritium for fusion. 
The fusion fuel of the secondary stage may be surrounded by depleted uranium or natural uranium, whose U-238 is not fissile and cannot sustain a chain reaction, but which is fissionable when bombarded by the high-energy neutrons released by fusion in the secondary stage. This process provides considerable energy yield, but is not considered a tertiary stage. Tertiary stages are further fusion stages, which have been only rarely used, and then only in the most powerful bombs ever made. Thermonuclear weapons may or may not use a boosted primary stage, use different types of fusion fuel, and may surround the fusion fuel with beryllium instead of depleted uranium to prevent early premature fission from occurring before the secondary is optimally compressed.